Welcome to the Flight Club Podcast, a woman's guide to leaning out. We give you a behind-the-scenes look at business launch and growth through the stories of successful female entrepreneurs. Here's your host, Felina Hansen, founder and CEO of Hera Hub. Hello and welcome. I'm excited to talk today with business law and intellectual property attorney Gayani Weera Singer. She is a longtime Hera Hub member and is one of our incredible gurus. We are grateful for her time. Her practice supports entrepreneurs and businesses, helping them with their transactional needs, including legal strategy, set up as business or partnership trademarks, IP, due diligence, and she really acts as a part-time um, counsel for companies or also will uh, act as in-house counsel for companies as well. She has an incredible background in biotech, and that really, really makes her incredibly valuable to all the amazing companies that we have here on the West Coast and, of course, the East Coast as well. So welcome to the show today, Gayani. Hi, Felina. Thank you so much for having me on this podcast. Yeah, I'm excited to share your story. Um, You have, holy smoke, uh, I'm looking at your LinkedIn profile right (laughs) now, and you have so much experience. Um, I cannot believe that you have so much under your belt at such a young age. Did you start going to law school when you were like five years old? <laughs> <laughs> we will go with that instead of. Okay. Okay. Age. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sounds good. Okay. Awesome. Well, start us off with, um, you did your undergrad in molecular cell biology at Cal state Northridge. What got you interested in science? And actually, from the start, I had asthma as a kid, allergy-induced asthma. So I always saw doctors as a way to, because i seen a lot of doctors growing up, um, you know, like somebody who make your life better. So I thought I will actually, I was pre-med. So that's where I started. <laughs> and then, of course, obviously, from this discussion, you know, I didn't stay there, but um, I was doing molecular cell biology as a pre-med student. Awesome. Awesome. And then what was the next step for you in your educational journey? So one thing that um, I do think our paths kind of get molded as we move forward. I, w- I really got into biomedical research in Cal State Northridge. I work for Dr. Steven Oppenheimer, who had a cancer developmental biology laboratory, and I really love research. Um, I was able to, because it's a Cal State, they didn't have PhD students, so they have master's students and undergrads getting more involved with research. I was able to run a couple of his big projects, and uh, so that's how it molded me into actually going toward more research versus pre-med because I particularly didn't like hospitals. <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh, while I had a goal thinking I want to be a doctor, it probably wouldn't have been a good fit because I hated the smell of hospitals. Mm-hmm. Um, you know? <laughs> um, so um, I found research to be a better fit. So Mm -hmm. I ended up graduating Cal Stage and going to National Institutes of Health, doing a post-bac fellowship at um, the Institute on Aging, Mm -hmm. uh, looking at neuroinflammation. And and that's where I went and then took, that's a three-year fellowship. I took three years off before starting graduate school at Johns Hopkins Mm -hmm. and and NIH. Wow. Amazing. Okay. So I want to back up a little bit. You talked about, you know, an interest when you were younger, you had asthma being a doctor. What, what was, did you have any family influence in choosing your career path? So I had to say, uh, I know a lot of the, um, South Asian um, you know, a lot of families in South Asian, they, they want your kids to be a doctor or lo- uh, um, doctor engineer and now maybe lawyers but um it's actually wasn't my parents it was my own ambition 
I think I really, uh, my mom is a teacher. My dad is a civil engineer. Mm. And um, they sort of um, kind of raised us to figure out what we want to do. And they were not pushing me to be a doctor. Actually, my mom talked me out of it when I, um, you know, trying to figure things out. She said, well, you seem to love research. Why don't you go with that? It seems less stressful as well. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. So talk about your time and your work at Johns Hopkins. Um, the, so Johns Hopkins program was very special because it's a graduate partnership program with NIH. And at that time, that was 2004, um, you know, they were, it was a kind of a new program where you get your degree from the Johns Hopkins, but your lab is going to be at NIH, National Institutes of Health. So um, I really, I was studying um, diabetes and uh, well, I first started at a different lab, but I switched labs. I, I, I hit some roadblocks in my graduate program. It's a PhD program. And I had to say, I did take a terminal master's after six years. Mm -hmm. And that's how I ended up in law school. So I don't know if I answered your question, but um, basically I started with the um, graduate program, switched my area of studies um, after my first thesis lab to a second thesis lab. And then um, due to some circumstances, and I ended up with uh, ended up leaving the program altogether with a terminal master's. Okay, and what prompted law school from there? Because <laughs> that's a pretty big jump, <laughs> not only physically but career wise. Yeah. So um, I I've been vocal. I started sharing this story because I used to just not disclose part of this story. Um, I got sexually harassed by my first. Uh, principal advisor PI uh, of my oh, thesis gosh. lab. Um, so I had to switch labs because um, it was not a good situation. Hmm. And um, when I switched, I lost two years of my work. And um, my thesis lab, I mentioned the diabetes lab, is not that lab. I don't want to put any misunderstandings <laughs> out there. I I was studying there, but I had a lot of anger. I felt very disempowered during this situation. And this was about 2006, uh, not a time when there was the Me Too movement was there. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew if I had um, taken any um action legal action i will be blackballed from the whole community so mm -hmm. i um i wrote a, i filed a report with the nih but i did i switched labs uh took my losses um grudgingly <laughs> mm -hmm. and um uh, at the same time my sister was finishing up law school in 2008 2009 and she knew my journey my younger sister and she she was telling me, why don't you come to law? Because you will have a lot more options. Mm -hmm. And because of the journey I had through the grad school, having gone through this lab, um, switching and feeling disempowered, I my my interest changed during that time. Mm -hmm. And I did feel that I wanted to change. And um, I was looking at initially going to consulting, but it was 2008, 2009 when the the economy was crashing and they were not hiring any new consultants, Deloitte, McKinsey, all of them had laid off a lot of their associates. So I knew either I, if I'm switching, I had to get a um, go to business school. I was looking at business school or law school and law school felt more um, aligned. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that you went through that. And I'm glad to hear that you're telling that story now because, you know, we need these stories to be told. Um, and so interesting that it really set you on an entirely different course of action. But, you know, beautiful to see how, you know, your background in science and law have come together through the work that you've done since. I I want to get into, um, you know, I see that you, you did some interning and some research, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously while in law school, 
What was the first kind of big job that you had right out of law school? Right out of law school, I did have a little challenge uh, trying to find a job because mm-hmm. I went to a local law school, um, you know, so, but at the same time, I did, um, the big job I got was going in-house at a bio, public biopharma. Mm-hmm. Um, they hired me because I had all these amazing internships while I was at law school. I worked for three different judges. I interned at Pfizer legal department I worked at a couple of other law law firms um so um it's actually I I do say this whole journey has a through the law school has been my empowerment journey mm. I um you know obviously I have talked to therapists and I have worked through some of the stuff that I I I, I was walking with the baggage um releasing those so my first job was amazing. I was in house, and they, um, their general counsel hired me, and they basically told me that I'm going to be his right hand. Mm-hmm. And I worked on a lot of different deals. I I helped with the day to day, con all the contract negotiations for the biotech. I helped with the compliance aspect, putting the processes together working with the scientific groups to decide when to file certain things, um, you know, advising them on the strategy and evaluating their IP position, IP meaning intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So um, it was an amazing job. And I got a lot of experience, uh, even though I was only there for a short time because after merge acquisition, I actually helped work on, um, I got laid off in that because I was, the most junior person on the staff Mm -hmm. and I then went into a bigger firm and talk about this you know process of being in-house at a big law firm um I I have talked to a lot of attorneys over the years and heard and read accounts that you know it can be stressful working in-house there's so much that you know there's so much on your plate um and that's why we see at Hera Hub a lot of folks like yourself who were in-house and said you know what i'm going to go do my own thing and and we'll get to that here in a bit but what you know what was that culture like in-house So I had to say, I did, one thing I really did like is you get to really directly interact in the corporation, in the biotech, uh, with the people who are creating, you know, Um, and because I was a scientist, it kind of fed my, that aspect of my scientific side and my legal side, but it is a lot of work. And I did feel that in-house jobs can be very different. When I was interning at Pfizer, they had a much bigger legal department. So there was a lot of support while uh, this was a smaller place. And I was working about 80 hours a week and I, I was salary, unlike um, with a law firm where you're billing hourly. So it was very challenging. I was getting burned out because I was on these very early morning calls or late night calls. And I had at, at any point of time, I had like 10, 15 agreements on my desk that I had to finish through while I was working on these all other projects. And also in like summer, I would have interns that I was also supervising. So um, it was very challenging. And then um, the in-house at like a law firm, um, they, you know, the culture wasn't very good fit for me. I had challenging experience there. So I actually left after five and a half months. But during that time, I did a lot of uh, IP due diligence projects. Um, where, uh, you know, we were the counsel for the banks, New York banks that were funding merger acquisitions with biotechs and mm-hmm. looking at what these biotechs say they have. So I gained a lot of valuable skill set. Um, but yeah, it, um, the law firm cultures, as you have heard, it's very challenging because there there's a lot of emphasis on billing <laughs> And very less, um, you know, while they talk about work-life balance, that's really not something that come across a lot of times, least in my experience. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. So what, at what point in this process did you decide, Gayani, that you were, you know, going to go it on your own, take all this amazing experience <laughs> that you'd put together over the course of your career and set sail, take flight as an entrepreneur? Yeah, so, um, you know, my again, my sister come into play. She is an attorney. She does business law and estate planning. And she had launched her own practice a few years earlier. Um, so she kept on telling me, why don't you launch? Mm -hmm. But, you know, as a, somebody who worked on, like, patent, uh, I'm a patent attorney. I, I, I don't prosecute patents anymore, but I felt I needed more training. So I wasn't still ready to launch. I did go to another smaller firm that um, had a little better balance. Uh, but of course, I did get laid off after they, um, the work shifted for them mm. because I was the most expensive employee they had. Um, at that point, I had been in practice for five years. So I was um, I was looking at either going in-house again um, or launching my own. And uh, basically, Universe sort of decided for me at the time because I, I did some interviews, but nothing in-house was lining up for me at the time. So I decided to launch. And the very next day, I had my first client give me a retainer check. Amazing. That's a, that's a pretty good start <laughs> to your business launch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was I was very hesitant. Uh, part of it is that, you know, also because I was burned out, the uh, law firm, like I said, was also very challenging. There's a part of me who kind of really thought maybe I will leave law because I was, I think when you met me in 2019, when I launched, I was pretty uh, tired and burned mm -hmm. out. And I think I was thinking if this doesn't work, I will really be changing again, pivoting. Yeah. But um, I had to uh, happy to say that that's haven't been the case. I love what I do. Um, you know, launching was not a mistake. <laughs> it was the best thing I have done for myself. And um, don't get me wrong, there are challenges. But at the same time, the autonomy and the freedom you have to be who you are is amazing. Yeah. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> Awesome. So talk about uh, some of the clients that you support through your law practice and, and the type of work you do now. So one thing I really like is once I launch, I realize I get to decide what I work on. So I, I took patent prosecution off of my table because I, honestly to do it as a solo um, is challenging because mm -hmm. you need a docketing system and everything. And I didn't really enjoy writing a 200 page pattern. <laughs> so, and it's not something I have done a lot. So there's a formula to it as well. And so I feel more comfortable doing other transactional like IP licensing. Mm -hmm. um, I do trademark prosecution. I do business partnerships, business um, entity formations. So I work with a lot of different clients. I I really love this part because even when you're in-house, you kind of work with the same clients, same things, right? So mm -hmm. one thing I love about being on my own is also I get to experience a lot of different um you know, projects coming from different businesses. So I have um, some clients who are in biotechs where I'm helping them with their biotechs agreements because that's my specialty. Uh, but I'm also working with other entrepreneurs in like Hera Hub space with their trademarks. Um, some people who are working on um, like spiritual business, energy a business or something or um, um, tutoring or some kind of a consulting business, helping them with their little CEO, um, their trademark or their strategy. So it's been fun because you're not limited and you also get to know all these different business owners and helping them create their vision and uh, secure their um, IP, intellectual property, which is one of the main assets to a business. Um, it's fun and it's, it's creating and you get to um, create with them. I do see it as a partnership, co-creation. Yeah, absolutely. 
Gani, I don't want to get too into the weeds on this because we could talk for weeks on the topic of AI and protecting and (laughs) protecting your intellectual property, but um, maybe just some quick advice uh, for entrepreneurs out there that are listening to this and are concerned, right? You know, they're creating content, they're creating imagery, they're, you know, putting all this out into the world and, you know, how do you protect it? So I do have to say, as the law st- stands right now, I did write an article on this that I'm happy to share that's on San Diego Lawyer with the co-author, of, a friend of mine. Um, right now, if you use AI tool to create some kind of an invention, the part that the AI tool is used for will not be patentable mm-hmm. um, the, because uh, only human um, inventor can patent. Mm-hmm. Same thing for copyright right now as it stands. Uh, copyrights, um, you have to have your original works and if you use an AI tool and it is not disclosed because while you file these, if you decide not to disclose it, that is fraud and you are distinct to all these uh, federal laws. So, um, you know, you will not get the rights to the parts that are created by AI. You had mm-hmm. to disclose those. Um, other thing, Felina, if I may, add to the entrepreneurs and business owners out there is the new Corporate Transparency Act that's going to affect a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you have a business, you do have to um, come into compliance by next year. Basically, you have to submit who are the beneficiaries of your business are to a federal database that includes sometimes more than owners of a business. Um, So I just want to put it out there because if you don't come into compliance by January 2025, there are severe penalties, um, like $500 a day type of penalties there. So um, I just want to get that out there. That's because your community involves a lot of um, people who have their own LLCs and um, businesses. Okay. And that's no matter what size of company, there is no threshold as far as number Um, of employees or. So there are some few exceptions. I do think um, if I, I'm looking into this more because I'm actually going to be doing a couple of programs for attorneys Mm -hmm. about the compliance of this uh, because business attorneys who are forming these also going to have to know this law really well. And I'm one of them. So I gave myself a task. <laughs> so, um, yes, there are a few exceptions. One of them is, a pub, of course, if you're a public company, you don't have to. But um, there isn't that many exceptions. So I would say it's first take a look at the site. Um, also, the other thing I will put out is there's a fraud alerts out there mm-hmm. because there are people uh, who are monetizing on this saying you have they will do this or pay this much. Yeah. Um, it's actually a pre to submit um, on that website. The, it's a government website. It's federal. So everybody in the country will have to do it. And any foreign con- foreign corporation that is functioning in U.S. will have to submit these. So it's a good thing to know. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll definitely want to put out an article on the Hera Herald about it for our community and the broader community. So I'll look forward to sharing that info. Yeah, I'm I'm working on some of those, so I'm happy to share those resources. Once yes. hopefully by March, I will have all that information together. Okay, great, awesome. Well, uh, I want to talk a bit about the future of your business. You know where you're going, what you're working on, and I will also saw this on your LinkedIn. It says you are host of Inventive Mind. What is that? So one of the pet projects, uh, passion projects I took up when I launched is um, launching a YouTube channel called Invent You Mind. Um, and I did that for a couple of reasons. One, the topics I cover are very complex and I wanted it to be a secondary resource for my for clients or potential clients when I tell them about it, what's the difference between a trademark versus a copyright or a patent that they have something that I put together they could go and listen to. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Two, you know, there isn't when you think of a business attorney, you may not really think of somebody like me, who is a sh petite, short um, <laughs> South Asian. <laughs> so, um, so I thought this is kind of an opportunity to break that barrier, um, unconscious bar barrier. So, um, but I had to, I, I will shame, shamefully admit that I have not uploaded any new videos in last year and a half, I think. Um, it's something I mean to get back to. Um, I do have to thank you, Felina. You like when I first launched, uh, you know, say here have been Sorrento had all this set up. So I was using all of that and listening to you when you said, don't try to be perfect, just <laughs> get it out there. So yeah. so I was working on it. I do have a whole bunch of videos there. I think I have like 50 videos though, hmm. because for the first couple of years, I was very um uh, <laughs> good and then yeah. I I got busy and for the future of my business for answer that question um you know what I look for is really helping business owners with what they want to create and um I do have a couple of main clients I'm working with and um you know biotechs kind of sometimes have these periods where they are doing capital races. So um, I'm currently kind of in one of those phases and I'm hoping to bring in a couple more um, steady retainer clients. They don't have to be a biotech. It could be a business who need um, general counsel services from a, but don't want to hire full-time, but can hire somebody part-time um, as a consultant. So that's what I'm looking for. I like this, um, you know, work I do, and I um, that's where I'm at right now, and I'm enjoying it. And as for other things, I'm kind of allowing the my intuition and universe to kind of align me to some things. That's and awesome. One of the things I'm thinking about is I just finished Athena San Diego. They have um, women on boards program. I mm -hmm. did just completed that last year. So maybe getting on a board of private or public. Yeah. I've been on a couple of nonprofit boards, but, um, you know, so it's something I'm, I'm thinking of doing that is, um, you know, if it's aligned for me. That's awesome. I love it. Wonderful. Well, Gianni, if our members and listeners want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, you could find me through Hera Hub. You could find me through LinkedIn. Uh, I'm always like very much present on LinkedIn. And if you message me, tell me how you know me. Um, because you know, I get a lot of solicitation um messages as well. Um, so, um, and then if you're part of Hero Hub, my contact information is there too. So, okay. And website is lawgrw.com, right? Yeah, that's okay. my website. And it's really a placeholder to that. So you could also look at my stuff. Uh, most of my presence is on LinkedIn, I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, Gayani, thank you so, so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. It's been fun getting to know you even better. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for joining this week's episode of Flight Club, sponsored by Hera Hub. We look forward to sharing more success stories with you soon. 